afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. My name is Lauren Williams, and I'm Adult and Community Services Manager here at the Columbia Public Library. Uh, welcome to today's Lunch and Learn with Randy Cole from the Columbia Housing Authority. Today's Lunch and Learn is co-hosted, as usual, by the League of Women Voters of Columbia Boone County and the library. And we have people attending both in person and on Zoom today, so just a few Zoom housekeeping items. Um, if you are on Zoom and you want to ask a question um, during the Q&A portion of the event, go ahead and put that question in the chat and uh, we will make sure that our presenter sees that question. Also, we ask that when you put in that question, if you would select everyone as the people that can see your chat, that way other people know what has already been asked. Uh, so for those of you in the room, if you have questions either during the presentation or at the end, raise your hand, I will come around with a microphone and that makes sure that the people on Zoom can also hear the questions being asked. We are recording this presentation, so it will be available on the library's YouTube page, as well as the League of Women Voters YouTube page um, for future viewing, or if you want to share uh, with your, your family and friends. Um, and now I'd like to welcome Barbara Hoppe of the League of Women Voters of Columbia Boone County to say a few words and introduce our speaker. Oh, thank you very much, Lauren Williams and the Columbia Public Library for co-hosting this, and thanks for everyone who's here in person, and thanks for everyone who's on Zoom. And thanks to Randy Cole for coming today to talk about um, affordable housing and creative solutions. Um, I'm sure he has lots to share and I'm sure there's lots of questions that people would like to um, ask him. So we'll try to cover both of those um, maybe during the presentation as well as after the presentation. And I just wanted to say a little bit about Randy for a history if some of you don't know. Um, Randy is the Chief Executive Officer of the Columbia Housing Authority, and before that, for many years, I'm not sure how many, um, he worked for the, the City of Columbia as the Columbia, Columbia Housing Authority um, Manager, I think it was, and um, I know I interacted and heard from Randy a lot when I was on City Council. Um, he's been, he's worked with city boards, commissions, task force. Um, he spearheaded the implementation of the Columbia Community Land Trust 501c3, um, and I forget what year that was, but a little ways back. Um, he was awarded the Columbia Chamber of Commerce Citizen of the Year Award for Innovation in uh, Affordable Housing in 2021. He has a Master's of Public Affairs and a Bachelor of from Political Science or in Political Science from the University of Missouri. Um, he's presented at national conferences on affordable housing, community development, and community land trusts. Um, so he's older than he looks. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to mention in 2018, I learned Randy led a team of colleagues from across the country to organize a 50 member planning charrette in Philadelphia. And it consisted of community land trust executive directors, nonprofit affordable housing providers, um, housing policy advocates and city officials from across the country to discuss um, efforts to create affordable housing. So with that, I give you Randy Cole. We well, appreciate the opportunity to come speak here today. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me in the back. Um, yeah, I love talking about the Columbia Housing Authority. I've been there since May of 2021. So I was going to focus a lot on uh, the Columbia Housing Authority as an organization, uh, kind of where we've come over the last three years. Uh, and then Diane Schuler, when she was corresponding with me, asked me to talk a, a bit about our redevelopment projects that we have underway at Kenny Point, uh, Park Avenue, Providence Walkway, some of our remaining uh, public housing units that were working to renovate, uh, build new, and, and uh, convert from public housing. So those are the things I was going to talk about today. Um, but feel free to uh, ask questions. I think we're going to save them towards the end. Um, and I'm happy to um, you know go answer any questions we have. So I'm going to talk a bit about um, who we are as the Columbia Housing Authority, 
uh, our impact, our, our current five-year strategic priorities, um, and then some of the redevelopment on, going on on our properties. Uh, so this is our mission as an organization, uh, provide quality affordable housing opportunities with supportive and economic resources to eligible households in Columbia and Boone County. A lot of uh, people don't know, but we are countywide. Uh, it was in the mid 2000s uh, that the Columbia Housing Authority was approached by, I think, HUD and the county to take over the county vouchers because there's really good capacity with an organization. Uh, so we took those on uh, back then and have been uh, managing those ever since. Our vision, we really want to be the community's leading uh, affordable housing provider. And I think the Columbia Housing Authority has been that uh, for many, many years. It's been in existence for 65 years. Um, lots of support from our city, our county, uh, a variety of leaders all along the way uh, over those 65 years. A lot of staff that were dedicated to the organization. And as I've stepped into the role, you really see the value of all of that uh, organizational inertia, uh, thousands of transactions every year, um, many, many audits, many, many course corrections, many, many interactions with clients, many uh, passionate staff, board members, community members, council members, um, and all of that still holds with that organization and helps carry it forward. Uh, that organization, sorry, back on that slide, it, our, we are a separate entity from the city. Uh, some people, uh, that's, that's not as clear when you, when you look at our name, but we are a separate organization. Uh, we do have accountability to the city. We feel we have accountability uh, to the whole county and the entire community. Uh, but the mayor appoints our board uh, and was created by city ordinance in 1956. Uh, so we don't have articles of incorporation. We have an ordinance under state law that authorized us and created us back in 1956. So as an entity, our core entity, the Public Housing Authority, is a municipal entity under state law, uh, which is interesting and helpful. Uh, because it, it gives us both unique powers and unique duties. Uh, some of those powers are we have the ability to issue bonds, which makes us really strategically advantaged for doing large-scale affordable housing projects. Um, and when I think of um, you know, being a municipal entity, I think we're, we're not only mission-driven, but we're duty-driven. We have a duty to operate the Section 8 program to do our housing. Uh, we don't have a choice. We can't change our mission. This is what we were created to do. So that that brings both a, a greater level of passion for the project and a higher level of responsibility uh, when you think about that at night sometimes. Um, but who we are as an entity, we provide affordable housing. Uh, and we do that through our properties that we own under our public housing authority entity. And then we also have low income housing tax credit properties. We've been converting from uh, public housing to low income housing tax credits. Uh, my predecessor, uh, was really innovative and forward thinking and got the organization set on that trajectory back in uh, 2013, 2014. Uh, but we have about 750 units. And then we all have, also have a variety of voucher programs uh, from the Housing Choice Voucher Program or Section 8 uh, through the VASH Program, Veterans Affairs uh, Supportive Housing. And then we have several special homeless voucher programs, uh, I think it's like a half a dozen. Uh, so we've got a lot of vouchers, and those vouchers have been growing, the number of them, over the last uh, three years. We've increased by close to 90 vouchers. Some of those were special programs we applied to uh, because we're in a good position. Some of them were Section 8 vouchers that got pulled from other cities and over to ours. HUD is often relooking at allocating money, so it's, it really speaks to making sure we're fully utilizing our resources. Another big part of the who the Columbia Housing Authority is, and this makes us really unique from a lot of other housing authorities across the country. Many do have supportive services, um, but from being in tune with what's going on around the rest of the country and other organizations, we are really unique on the level of services we have. Uh, we have uh, a whole resident services department that's funded by about a million dollars annually in budget from the city, the county, United Way, uh, the state. Uh, other funding sources that we apply to through the federal government, uh, but they provide supportive services, wraparound services, uh, make them made available to all of our uh, people that live in our housing or are uh, utilizing a voucher. And we do that through a variety of populations. For our elderly and disabled populations, we have case management and independent living services. Uh, also, really good partnerships with local entities like Services for Independent Living. We have a contract for them to help us with transportation. Uh, and then we also have a food pantry uh, in partnership with the food bank where we help allocate out about 100,000 pounds of food uh, every year. Uh, we also have a lot for families and youth. Uh, our Living Ahead program just celebrated its 20 year anniversary. 
this last year. It's a, a really good program that uh, my board really pushed me from the beginning to really look at how can we grow and enhance those services. So we've went from serving about 60 youth to now we're up to 100 on a daily basis. We've also invested in our staff. We went from uh, two full-time staff to we have four and then a couple three-quarter time staff. So we have more staff, more coverage for the youth. Uh, our staff are also paid higher in that program. Um, and we're doing a lot of investments in their facility, uh, investments in their software for tracking youth. So we are a licensed child care provider under that program. Uh, that whole service line is about $750,000 annual in budget. Um, and it's a really, really fine-tuned operation that transports the kids that are school-aged from their schools to our facilities, and then they transport them home. Uh, we feed them, we do tutoring, uh, hugs, all kinds of good stuff, activities. In the summer, they go to the St. Louis, Kansas City, the zoo, uh, museum, you name it. Uh, but we also do case management for families, uh, a lot with our family self-sufficiency program. That's a program where um, residents that are in a position to kind of move beyond from being just stabilized to uh, move on and up into the next step, get into market rate housing, maybe home ownership someday. Uh, we have about 125 households participating in that program uh, with two family self-sufficiency uh, case managers. Uh, that team has been doing a great job of growing uh, the program since before I came on, but they've continued that. Um, and we met a qualification this year to where HUD is gonna allow us to add an additional FSS worker and fund that position. So we're gonna keep continuing to grow that program, uh, which is really excellent. Uh, the, the essence of that program is our case managers work with the program participants to define five-year goals uh, to increase their income, their credit, their employment, and their, their self-sufficiency. And what comes with that, as their incomes rise, uh, what their rent would go up as they rise, uh, we match with savings uh, through our voucher programs. Uh, so oftentimes people graduating from that program will have between five to $15,000 in savings that they've put in and that we've matched. Uh, we had one two years ago, a household, uh, it was a, a young woman uh, with a partner and three kids came in at zero income, got some schooling at uh, Columbia College where she was kind of in the process of doing that, got stabilized with housing and her and her partner both got jobs making over 70 grand in, in total together. Uh, and throughout that program, they saved $40,000 and then became a homeowner at the end of it. Uh, now, that's not everyone's experience, but uh, we have a lot of really exciting success stories like that as well. And success looks a lot different for all, all different populations, but it's all just as highly valuable. Um, we also serve a lot of veterans. We have our Patriot Place project, uh, 25 units uh, that we work in tandem with uh, the VA, uh, where we help uh, vets that have experienced homelessness get into housing that has supportive services there on site through the VA. Uh, that's a, a, a great project. Uh, but we also uh, serve veterans throughout our properties and throughout our programs. So we probably serve on any given day close to four, 450 or so veterans. Um, in any given day. And right now we have about 100 of them out at Patriot Place doing a launch. Um, is Patriot Place also a part of Welcome Home? It's a good question. Um, so from a legal standpoint on ownership of the lots, it is not. Uh, there's a, a lot line that goes right down the middle of that parking lot. Uh, so Welcome Home, uh, they're, they own the other side. They're the emergency shelter uh, and they're a separate nonprofit. Uh, we uh, own the Patriot Place side, which is the uh, more long-term permanent housing. Um, that that project was it did have significant partnership early on by both the entities working together to get it off the ground, uh, and we continue to take referrals from Welcome Home and work work together to problem solve. And they're actually holding a large barbecue out there, both Welcome Home CHA and our investors, uh, in honor of Veterans Day. Um, so yeah. They, they, welcome home is separate, but uh, we're partners. Um, so some of the supportive services I mentioned, uh, you know, we have case management in both Packman and Oak Towers. Um, we also have an emerging partnership with Burrell, who we're hoping to get some uh, staff in Packman Towers, which I'm really excited about. Um, but we have a food pantry for that, that population or all, all of our populations, uh, but also lots of activities uh, that go on at both those towers. Um, we have transportation and also gardens available on site. Uh, so a, a lot for uh, those populations that we serve. For families and youth, I mentioned our Moving Ahead program. That's some of our youth uh, and Mayor Buffalo helping us with our 20-year 
uh, anniversary. Uh, they do a lot of field trips, tutoring, case management. Um, they also access the food pantry and basic needs. We do events as people go back to school with backpacks, books, and all kinds of good resources. Uh, lots of good partnership with VAC, uh, other nonprofits, Big Brothers, Big Sisters. Jabberwocky does a, a lot with our Moving Ahead program as well. Uh, I kind of discover partnerships as I've been uh, in this job since I've been at Columbia. This last summer, I didn't realize Jabberwocky uh, parks their large bus on Trinity every Sunday uh, or Saturday morning and does artwork with those, all the youth that live there. But there's there's just a tremendous amount of partnership and great things that go on uh, from the Columbia Housing Authority and through our local partners. Um, this is our Patriot Place uh, and veterans. We serve you know, 25 households there at Patriot Place. Uh, and then we have supportive services on site through the VA. Uh, they help with employment, health, uh, other, other mental health uh, related services. But again, we send veterans from Paquin Tower to our family sites, to our voucher programs. Um, we have a lot of veterans in our community that, that need housing with services. Um, a lot of people ask me, um, so how many people move on and up uh, out of the housing authority every year? Um, so that, that's uh, you know, something important to think about. Uh, certainly everyone's experience different that comes to the housing authority and everyone's goals for where their next step are, are different. And, and some people, um, they want to stay with us and, and live a life in dignity and do activities and have a nice place to live. And that's just fine too. Uh, but each year, um, this is pretty, I started tracking this. It was when VU asked us that question, uh, Eric Morse there. So I started tracking it in 2022. Um, and our 20, 22 numbers were very close to the ones on the far left and the far right. Um, and this is interesting too. So we had 143 households in our programs at the beginning of 2023. Uh, and then 95 households across our programs increased their income to a level at which they no longer qualified. So they moved up into market rate housing. So we have a chunk moving out and a chunk moving in. Um, and both, both these years, uh, 2022 and 2023, have bigger moving in than going out but we've been accepting new vouchers and expanding the utilization of vouchers. So I'm really excited to see what 2024 looks like if it's like more even, because uh, it's it's pretty close now. But I think it does speak to every year we have people that have found stability, found that next step, and they move on and up into the next step and it creates space for the next people that need that stability to move in. And then we do have a pretty good amount of, of people that are uh, either elderly or disabled. It's about 50%. Um, that uh, that's not the goal. The, our goal is to help make sure they have a really nice place to live, good laundry facilities, good activities, um, you know, a nice environment that's that's fun to be at. Um, this is a slide I was putting together to, for our open enrollment meeting tomorrow uh, with our staff, thinking through really good accomplishments we've had in the last uh, couple of years. Um, and I, I think it speaks to our whole team. We have about 85 employees as an organization, uh, and it takes all of them to make the organization run. Um, so right now, I pulled this data yesterday. We're serving 1,899 households as of yesterday with affordable housing and supportive services. Uh, and that's about 3,700 uh, persons. Um, so that's a, a big impact on our community. Uh, but within the last two years, we've maximized all of our voucher utilization across our voucher programs. Uh, we have one small one, our mainstream, where we still have maybe 10 slots open. Uh, but our Section 8, we've had the brakes on and not issuing vouchers for close to three months uh, because we've been taking on vouchers, but really pumping them out and getting them connected to housing and utilizing our resources. Uh, so that's a really good thing. Um, we had 100% on our CMAP score last year, and that is basically a performance review by, by HUD that we have to submit every year on how well we're operating the Section 8 program. That covers 12 different criteria from how well we're connecting with landlords to what our application process is like, our inspection processes, how accurate our review of household income is, and how it relates to what required rent they should pay. Um, so there's a lot of metrics that goes into it. We got an email from HUD and said, great job, you got 100%. Uh, and we don't get that every year, uh, but we've had a lot of attention to the program. Um, we achieved this last month, we had 98.9% .9 occupancy on all of our LIHTC projects. So these are all the projects that have been through renovations, uh, but our remaining 120 units of public housing that we're getting ready to either 
rehab or tear down and build new. That excludes those uh, because we haven't been refilling units because we're getting ready to, to tear them down. So they're, they're operating only about 70%. But of the units that are a portfolio that we need to be utilizing, uh, we're at 98.9%. Packland and Oak Tower have hit 100%, I think twice within the last two months uh, a piece, uh, which speaks to the need for affordable housing. Uh, but from our smaller worldview, it, it means we're fully utilizing our resources. We need to make sure uh, we're, we're using our resources. Uh, we've been increasing our utilization of reserves in each of our property accounts. A lot of our projects that have been through uh, LIHTC or Low Income Housing Tax Credit, and there's been a lot of renovations. Some of them are approaching eight years old, so those are now getting old again. <laughs> so, uh, we've been doing some work on properties, doing some investments uh, in some of the uh, ground source heat pump in Paquin Tower. Uh, we're getting ready to replace a couple of stairways and repaint Patriot Place. Uh, but we're accessing those reserves, which is really good. Uh, in the past, we would access money that's allocated on an annual basis from HUD uh, and then just do the most neediest priority. But each of our LIHTC properties, uh, there are six of them, have their own reserves accounts that we capitalize at the beginning of the project and pay throughout the, the life of the project. Uh, some accounts are, are larger than others, so some we can really do a lot of work, some we have to be you know, a little more studious with. Uh, but it, it does speak to being more independent of an organization, and being more sustainable, and being able to care for our properties. I got a question. How much of the annual budget for housing comes from the federal government? Um, I would say our annual budget for the Housing Authority, it's probably 85% of our budget uh, comes from the feds. Well, uh, but then a fair amount comes, comes from our residents. It's probably 75 to 80, uh, somewhere in there. Uh, because a lot of our residents, like that live in our properties, they pay a portion of their rent. Um, thinking through like our family sites, the average rent payment from residents is about $250 per month because um, it's all income based. So people that are zero income might pay zero. People that are right at the top of the qualifications might be paying full rent. Um, uh, so that's something that I always keep in mind when we're thinking about investments in our properties. How do you plan to continue to fund? 85 staff. Well, we are, we're fully funded on our budget uh, this year. Uh, we have uh, a really good budget for 2025. Uh, we're doing a 4% COLA. We're also offering a little greater increase on our uh, high deductible health count. Uh, our premiums for that are down to zero. Um, and then we're putting away some money in reserve. So um, well, we were a very well funded organization with enough funding streams to fund 85 staff. Um, I would anticipate that that probably grows over the next three years or so as we go through the light type redevelopment process. I know there's questions about what is the federal budget going to look like with the new administration. Um, I kind of look back to what happened on the, the first go around. And when, you know, things are definitely going to be different on a second. Uh, I believe we saw about a two, two to five percent reduction on like the third or fourth year of the Trump administration. So it wasn't catastrophic. So hopefully, History repeats itself in that manner, but I guess we will all see. Um, we've expanded youth serve. I mentioned that earlier in the moving ahead program. So we're serving more kids with after school programming than we've served before. Uh, we're expanding our self sufficiency position uh, and we're supporting our resident tower voices as well, making sure they have good, uh, secure food uh, and funding for food. Uh, the United Way uh, and you just gave us $15,000 to help us carry uh, into the, the winter on stocking up our freezers in both Paquin and Oak Tower. And we're really grateful for those donations. Uh, since 2021, we've also uh, had uh, over $46 million in funding awards to renovate and expand our portfolio. Um, something important to remember, and I, I remind my staff, is that doesn't mean $46 million just shows up. You've got to do the projects and draw it down uh, to realize that as an organization and get get it all leased up. Uh, but certainly it will be good as we complete those projects uh, and our Kenny Point project is underway and Park Avenue should be soon. But I think it just speaks to all the community support that we've got as an organization uh, that's been there for a long, long time. And as it continues, that really uh, helps us as an organization. Um, some other important accomplishments that I've noted to other groups and my staff. Uh, last year, we got selected for a comprehensive monitoring from HUD. Uh, there was a congressional initiative, uh, so we had six or seven um, 
the federal officials in our offices for about a week reviewing just about everything. Um, but they were they were polite, uh, but they were thorough. Um, and when they were done, we had you know a couple like any audit, a couple of things they wanted us to address and change. But they also had uh, some best practices noted. Uh, they noted our comprehensive updates to the board and the public. Um, regular meetings with the resident advisory board. Uh, we have a resident advisory board of about 35 residents that I meet with uh, just about every month. We take a couple months off during the year. Uh, but I go and give updates on what's going on, and then I also hear their concerns, things they want us to address, and we stay in tune, um, and that's that's really good to do. Um, something you can we can operationalize that uh, from those uh, meetings. Uh, last month, the resident advisory board uh, was really uh, raising a need to replace the laundry in Paquin and Oak. Um, so we had enough money in our reserves, and we're spending about $120,000 between here and February to replace all the laundry equipment. So we've got nice, new, efficient uh, stuff. Uh, but really, the residents are, are, are the canary in the coal mine of where we need to put attention for our facilities. Um, they also said we had good Section 8 performance and a strong commitment to supportive services because we have a, a lot of supportive services. Uh, some of our five-year strategic priorities, uh, the big ones, redevelopment. Uh, we want to expand with our Kinney Point project, uh, complete our Park Avenue project. That's 70 units right behind the armory uh, that we're tearing down and building new. Providence Walkway, um, it's over by our admin building along Trinity. It's 25 units now. Uh, we're rehabbing and doing some new construction. And then our remaining development, Blind Boone Apartments, that's 27 um, units. We're waiting to hear from MHD, MHDC, the Missouri Housing Development Commission, the first week of December on whether or not we get fully funded there. So if we get fully funded there, we'll be over the $50 million mark. Uh, but we applied for 9% credits. They're a little more competitive. So uh, we'll just have to wait and see if we if we win out. Uh, we want to continue expanding the Moving Ahead program, both in uh, numbers served and quality of services. Uh, we've budgeted a new van this year to make sure we've got good transportation. Uh, so they've got three vans and a couple of them are a little old. Uh, but we're also looking at uh, how to improve our operations since I've been there. Now, when I stepped in, it, it was uh, certainly a strong organization, uh, but like all organizations, um, it need to con continually improve and look where we can get better. Uh, but we updated our logo, so we have a new logo uh, as of 2022. Uh, early on when we started getting funding awards, uh, I found it very important to do a conflict of interest training on uh, procurement, uh, hiring practices, you know, with all of these uh, federal funds coming in, we're certainly going to see an audit at the end of this. Uh, that's kind of how the story goes. I've been through the American Reinvestment Recovery Act, the CARES Act funding, and different roles. Uh, so I just really drove home the points with all, all of my staff of what's appropriate, uh, along with nepotism. Um, that's a good thing to remind folks on. We're a public entity, so we hire on experience and skills. Um, also, implement a performance review policy. Uh, and just had a little... Uh, gap there when I stepped in, but now we have 100% compliance the last two years because we tied performance reviews to cost of living adjustments. You had to have one done, no matter how good or bad it was, you just had to have it done um, and had discussed it and looked at it and thought about goals for the next year, and then you can get your cost of living adjustments. So uh, we've had good compliance with it uh, by tying it to there. Um, we've increased uh, pay for frontline staff, both the ranges and the amounts paid. Um, we, uh, most of our Section 8 staff and property management staff, maintenance staff, they've increased 25% since 2021. Uh, this year, we'll, we'll tip over that with our cost of living adjustment. Um, we have a new budget format. Um, when I stepped in, our budget was in a, a good format, but it was you know, a three-page spreadsheet. We've just, we've grown so much since before I came on from a lot of good work. That we needed a more robust budget for myself and the board. So now it's a, a bound and tab book that's you know close to 50 pages, but also with a higher level of view to make make it not you know overwhelm the reader, but then does it get into the nitty-gritty. So we have a really good product this year that I'm excited about. Uh, things that I, I, I feel like we need to put a little more attention to as we go forward. We need a new website. We did do a refresh of it, but it really needs a more robust overhaul. Um, a new ERP system, so that's our software system. Um, this has been on my list uh, since I, uh, I came on, but we need everybody 
uh, kind of in their seats and trained and, and on board for that. Uh, I didn't want to do a big software uh, upgrade in the year that we're doing Park Avenue and other large development projects because that would be too big of a lift. Uh, we also noticed we needed to uh, address some data and computer and network equipment. Uh, so we've replaced 46 of 70 computers since 2021, and we'll get the remainder uh, before the end of December to make sure we've got our good hard infrastructure in place before we do a, a software upgrade. Um, and then I want to do a... a class and comp study from a, a third party firm. So that's kind of the operational things we have going on. It might not be as exciting, but I get excited talking about it. Um, so this is our Kinney Point apartments, uh, a, a version there. You know, it's 13.5 million uh, in total, funded by the city, the Veterans United Foundation, Missouri Housing Development Commission, uh, some of our own debt as an organization and equity that we put into it, and the Missouri Department of Economic Development. Uh, this is what the uh, units will look like along Sexton. Um, I was really excited about how these turned out. Uh, these are actually fourplexes. Uh, back in November of 2021, when we first approached uh, the Ridgeway neighborhood about doing the project, I thought it was really important to gather input from the neighborhood. So I rolled my barbecue grill out and we cooked burgers and hot dogs um, and asked them, what do you want to see here? And so a common theme that the whole group agreed upon was um, older, uh, they, they were like the older two and a half story homes that used to front Sexton. And they wanted this to kind of reflect some of that architectural feel rather than having one large building or something of that sort. So that's what we went with. And I think they were, the neighborhood was pleased with it. Um, also, this is a long grand. I'm really excited about these designs. Uh, these are actually duplexes. Uh, but the neighborhood also wanted our, our one bedroom units to look kind of like the bungalow uh, shotgun style houses along there. So this is a unit in the front and the unit in the back. So uh, there are six units amongst those three buildings. Uh, and they're one bedroom units that are about 580 square foot that have an accessible turnaround bath, um, kitchen, uh, stackable laundry, and a bedroom. Um, and I think these will be really replicable on small lots in central city neighborhoods that I think would also have some good neighborhood acceptance for doing a little more density, uh, but also, again, not being, um, you know, something that's dramatically different than the style. Um, this is our Park Avenue project. Uh, that number has now increased. It's close to 25 million now uh, from initial, initial project conception. When interest rates go up like they did, that, that increased us by about 700,000. And then some of our construction costs, stormwater costs, uh, but anyways, it's still very well funded. I think we only have, we'll have a million dollars of debt on it for a $25 million project. That's pretty good. Um, but when we were planning Park Avenue, again, we approached uh, the neighborhood, but I was really excited about this because the neighborhood was our residence. Um, so there's really direct feedback on what people want, what people need, and how we can best serve their needs. So that was, that was a lot of fun. We did a couple of barbecues, um, Powerhouse Community Development Corporation, uh, helped with some carnival things. We had, we actually had exotic animals out on Park Avenue, uh, lemurs and alligators and other things. Uh, helped get the residents out, make it fun. Um, I would say some of the design characteristics that we uh, changed from resident feedback or kind of drove it was they wanted a neighborhood feel. So we tried to do that with the, the architect uh, architectural features. And I think we've got that. Um, and then we had a couple of um, people over 60 years old that didn't want uh, people living above them. So we blended in some one bedroom units, enough for the existing uh, residents that are over 60 years old that they can get one without someone above. But if you're new moving in, you might get someone above. Um, so trying to do, you know, meet everybody's needs and also have a little bit of pragmatism. Uh, we added nine units to Park Avenue. And I'm really excited about talking about why we added nine units to Park Avenue. Um, and there, uh, you know, more is better because we need more housing. Um, but there are nine market rate units. And what we know is when you blend in different uh, economic uh, backgrounds into a project, uh, it's good for the project to have economic diversity. Uh, but we, we had to blend in the nine units to serve uh, people that lived on our properties that their incomes had risen above uh, to the level that would qualify. Uh, so um, public housing income limits are at 80% AMI. Um, LIHTC guidelines are at 50% AMI. So we had 
uh, nine households that would be over that were or that were even over the 80 percent so when we move people out nine of those would not have been able to move back uh, but since we blended in nine market rate units anyone that's living there now no matter what income you are when we move them out they're coming back uh, so long as they they want to and most most people do and will we will want to move back so i think it really speaks to um the importance of affordable housing so we have you know 70 units of uh, public housing that have exceeded its life cycle that we're tearing down, right? And there's no insulation in the walls. The foundations are failing. Uh, the furnaces aren't aren't very good. They're just it's not good housing. But people have that stability and they've risen their incomes above to where uh, you know they would qualify. So I think it speaks to just the basic need for affordable housing is so important for people to have. And um, because of the way this looks, most people wouldn't know that. Uh, so I think by changing the housing the way it looks, it better brands reality of who our residents are, what they need, and what they represent. Um, so I think it's going to be really good for our community. Uh, 70 units down there right now, but we're going to replace with 79. So we're tearing down uh, and building back new housing. And we're starting with the southeast block. Um, everyone, uh, they, the common question is, what are you going to do with all the people that are living there? Um, so within our downtown area, we have 120 units of public housing. Um, and since we've been funded, HUD has allowed us within that 120 unit portfolio to not refill as natural attrition occurs. You know, people move out for a variety of reasons. Sometimes uh, they move up to market rates. Sometimes they move town. Uh, so of those 120 units, we're running about 68% occupancy. So we have enough units configured at the correct bedroom size to move the first block and half of the second already. Uh, so we're gonna do it in three phases. We're gonna start with the bottom right block. And then we think once we get to the, the bottom left block that we could probably do the third at the same time. So uh, we've already got the first block mapped out of where uh, residents are moving from and to. Uh, we had another meeting last week. We'll have probably two or three meetings between here and February. Uh, our residents are excited. Uh, they are tired of, uh, talking to reporters or asking questions. They just want to move and have a new, nice new place. So we're trying to respect that. Um, Province Walkway, um, that's Trinity. So our admin building is kind of in the middle on the bottom there. Um, this was going to be 52 units, uh, but we did not get funded in our 9% application last year. Uh, so the city was very supportive and flexible enough to leave their ARPA funds with us and we applied for the 4% round, which is less competitive, and we did get funded. So we've gotten fully funded for that project. Uh, and that'll be 25 units. I'm excited about these one bedroom unit designs as well. Uh, along Trinity, we're doing full gut rehab uh, down to the studs. Um, but up on Worley, we have six one bedroom units. Um, but that, that front, the right side is the front, the left side is the back. They'll both up front poorly. Um, but the front, the two fronts will front really. And there's two one bedroom units on the bottom and then a one bed one one bedroom unit on the top. So it's a triplex, but it looks like a, a little one and a half story home that I think will fit in real nice with the neighborhood. And we're able to squeeze in parking requirements. So we didn't need any kind of adjustments or waivers or anything. So that that worked out really nice. Uh, that'll be on Worley, so that that'll a front Worley. You'll if you drive by there, you'll see vacant lots right next to Granny's house, uh, and they've been a really good supportive neighbor. Uh, and then this is our blind boot apartments. This is the last inner circle. Uh, the city and the county did commit uh, three hundred fifty thousand apiece in ARPA funds uh, within the last couple months, and then BU gave us another one seventy five. We'll have our own debt, and then. Uh, MHGC funding. This is the one where we are not yet fully funded. We're waiting that word from MHGC on their 3.5 million. So we will know the first or second week of December, but that's a very competitive process where uh, cities and organizations from all across the state compete for uh, you know finite resources. Uh, but I think with all of our support, we, we'll, we'll have a competitive application, but uh, we'll see. It's uh, that is right by our admin building as well, um, right along Providence. So if you drive up Providence and look, once you go by the Blind Boone facility, it's all of those units on the inner circle. So it's 27 units. I'm excited about this project too. It's really important 
not only from the housing standpoint, but from the stormwater standpoint. Um, if you drive through there after a rain, uh, you will see water like almost up to the building bottoms uh, and standing water, uh, like I've seen it halfway up my truck tires. Uh, the Flat Branch Creek starts up Sexton Road and goes underground. It actually cuts underground right in the middle of that property. You can kind of see that, that box, um, if I got a pointer. Um, right in the middle. Uh, you can kind of see this. The The creek is underground, flows right through there. So we're going to do a lot of underground detention here and some rain gardens out here and more bioretention here. Um, I think that'll really help both here and downstream, similar to the impact that the bioretention uh, that we did as part of Lynn Street Cottages up on Sexton Road. I think it speaks to how investing in affordable housing can also push forward other other needs and other investments in neighborhoods um, and that you know stormwater requirements aren't necessarily a bad thing they're a good thing there's an opportunity here to to make this property and the other part of the neighborhood better um, so that's that's it for now I could talk a lot hopefully that was helpful so we got a question here and then Marie has one in the back I'll, I'll read this one from the card real quick how does CHA housing fit into the continuum of affordable housing? in the city and county. Can you conjecture on how CHA's role evolved well revolves in the future from Diane Sheeler? And where's Diane at right now? Yeah. yeah. What country is she in? Jamaica. Jamaica. Wow, very cool. Um I hope she's enjoying that. Um so how we fit in the continuum of affordable housing, I guess I could go back to that slide that actually has the continuum on there. That would be helpful. So I put in here who we serve. So you think of homelessness, uh, you know, people that may be in shelters or out on the street or transitional housing. You know, I think right now we have a little over 200 on the point in time count. That's probably missing a number of people. That number might be more like 400, you know, in this category. Um, on our wait list, on people we serve uh, that are coming from being homeless into housing, um, we have about 1,200 on our wait list. It's been as high as 1,400, and that's households. So people, that might be over 3,000. Um, and on any given day, we serve you know, 1,900 households or about 3,700 people. Um, so that's how we fit in. We, we did a survey back in 2021 of our own residents of how many residents had experienced homelessness. And our survey, um, try not to use too much federal uh, you know, legal language, but we did follow the McKinney-Vento Act. So it included people living, you know, in a public space, in a shelter, or doubled up with a family member or friend, or out of a car, or at, not a place where you've been under a formal lease for the last 60 days. And 87% of our residents had experienced some form of homelessness in their life. Um, so we definitely impact it, uh, but we're different than a shelter. That's a different role, a different, you know, thing that needs to be done in our community. Uh, and but we do the the housing. So I hope that answers uh, Diane's question. Oh, she said, "Can you conjecture on how CHA role evolves in the future?" I don't know that our role will, will evolve too much. I think we will keep doing what we're doing. I think what will evolve slowly over time uh, is just refining further how we do it. Um, how we operate as an organization is really unique uh, as a landlord. Uh, because we have property maintenance, um, property management, safety. We have four retired police officers, and then we have social workers. And they all swarm around our properties to support our residents. And basically, they're problem solvers or problem alleviators. So that's what we do every day is solve problems or alleviate things going on. And then also help bring opportunity to people where we can as well. Um, so I would think, you know, we've seen mental health uh, as a growing need in our community. I think we will just keep refining that further further professionalizing that uh, to make what we do better and doing more of it as we move forward. I, I think that's how I see this evolve. Mari. Um, my question has to do with, and you mentioned this briefly, the, the Section 8 or the voucher programs. Yeah. Um, I'd be interested in knowing how many people utilize those or how many households. And also, um, is that meeting the need and are they able to find housing yeah. using those vouchers? Yeah, great question. Of those uh, 1,899 households um, on, on that we're serving right now, 
uh, about 600 of those are our vouchers going into the properties that we have. So you'd subtract about 500 off of those. So it's private market section eight vouchers, probably around 1300 households being served. Um, you want to know people, multiply it by about 2.3 people. Did that get all of your questions? Oh, me and the need. Yeah, so in most communities, uh, for every household that publicly, or qualifies for publicly assisted housing through vouchers or public housing, about one in four households are served. And uh, I haven't done a study locally, but I would think that that number carries pretty true in our community. I'm looking at ACS data. Um, so probably one in four households, I would think, pretty accurate. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, this last month, we just had Section 8 payments go out like they do every month. And we had 364 different uh, property managers or landlords. Some of those are our own legal entities. They probably need to subtract six off. So it's probably around 355 or so uh, landlords. We have a lot of landlords that have been with the Housing Authority for a long, long time and do a wonderful job. Um, certainly, there's, there's some that, you know, like anything, uh, aren't, aren't as good as the others. Uh, our experience, by and large, has been really positive with most of our landlords, but certainly there's some that we, we either have to put some attention to from our end or help uh, our tenants look for a different location. This may be way too detailed, but I'm curious um, whether any facet of what you do leaves room for somebody who has a felony but has served their time and is trying to make a new life. And and I know that Section 8 is um, not as tolerant, uh, but is there any facet of this where somebody who has? That's true, yeah. That that's a, that's an excellent question um, and one that I've received and looked into and we monitor data on this. Um, yeah, for Section 8 and our public housing uh, properties, if someone has a severe criminal conviction within the last five years, it can disqualify them, like uh, severe assault, rape, murder, um, drug sale of something, you know, really, really big or whatever. Um, it can disqualify them. Uh, but we do have a hearing process to where uh, if they're connected to services, uh, they have a, an advocate voice there with them. They can show a pattern of, you know, good behavior within the last you know, six months or a year or some kind of good extended period where we can we can see and document, uh, we will grant leeway to that. And that's a part of our policies and processes. Uh, last year, we had about 150 uh, or so that, you know, received some kind of uh, experience like that where they didn't qualify. Uh, and I believe uh, about 40%, you know, that came through were able to still get into housing uh, once they go that through that hearing process. So the key would be if you know someone that has a severe criminal history uh, that's really trying to get on the right track and they're making good effort. They just need to bring that information with them and they should still apply for our programs because we can still get them in uh, if they're connected to services and demonstrate a good pattern of behavior. And then another question has to do with the, the definition of disabled because there's so much now that falls within the mental health mm -hmm. um, spectrum, if you will, and not necessarily physically disabled. So does the, the definition of disability that you're working with include, or is it expansive enough to include the mental health side of things? It does include mental health as okay. well. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. And I'm sorry, I, I'm looking at my watch not because I want to leave, but I do have a, a one o'clock. We have an interview for uh, a key position I need to get to, but I could handle one more question if we wanted to. Well, it's my understanding that spec tech speculators, investors have bought up a lot of housing stock nationwide. Are you seeing that in Columbia, Boone County area? Do you see any avenues to prevent this? So, yeah, certainly VRBO, uh, some of those other you know, investment operations, it does take actual housing stock off of our market. It's a, it's a real thing. Um, and that reduces our supply. So it does impact affordable housing. It seems like the, the best way to address uh, that type of thing is with, uh, through policy, through our you know, local, federal, state, and government. Um, we just uh, try to grind it out and do the best we can with what, whatever is going on in the market. Yep. So thank you so much, Randy. That was very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 
And I just wanted to announce that our next uh, Lunch and Learn is on the uh, in December, um, December 11th. And we'll be hearing from Jeff Gander, who on the, um, from the Department of Transportation on the I-70-63 interchange. So we'll get more details on that and he'll answer questions. And also I wanted to make sure everyone is invited to the uh, Founders Day on December 15th coming up. So thank you all. And this is available um, through YouTube and you can go to our website, lwvcbc.org or to the library website to share it with others. Thank you so much.